We're going to continue in a series. I started uh, three weeks ago now, preached on the wise master builder. And then you can pass out those flyers too, wherever, whoever has those flyers to pass out. Go ahead and pass those out. I need somebody over on this side to pass flyers out on here and somebody in the middle. This morning will be the new era 2.0. Building. Let's start off in prayer. Lord, we just thank you today, God, for all that you're doing in the land. Lord, I enjoyed that worship so much. And Lord, we are entering into a season that violent worship is going to be our warfare that overthrows the structures of darkness. And we're just going to move into that, Lord, in a new way in Jesus' name. We thank you for it. Lord, show us what this new era looks like. Your word decrees that eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has it entered into the heart of us everything that you have for us. However, it says that you have revealed it by your spirit. And Lord, I just decree that you will release a revealing and unveiling, Lord, of your plans and purpose so that we know the direction to go in, Father, and that we can pursue Everything that you have for us, everything that you have for your body, everything that you have for this nation and for the world, in Jesus' name, amen. Now, in this new era, one of the things that I've been looking at as I've been studying this is that we're going to begin seeing an activated church, a church that is activist in nature. Now, there's several different levels of being an activist. You can be an activist in society. You can be an activist in your community. You can be an activist in, uh, in government. But one of the things I see is a very activated church, a church that is moving forward, a church that is not sitting in pews or sitting in seats. They're moving forward. They're taking possession. They're taking ground. They're taking land. They're healing the sick. They're raising the dead. They're unlocking doors. They're closing doors. Everything the Lord has called us to do, God is, about, is activating us into that realm right now. He is plan for you to move from being a pew warmer to one who is activated to doing the works that Jesus did. He promised us that the works that he did, we would do also, and even greater works than these would we do. But in order to do that, we have to be an activated church. And I believe that we are that today. I believe that we're activated to go beyond the pew, beyond the seats on a Sunday morning. We're activated to go beyond Sunday morning and get into our society, into education, get into business, get into the beach. Not just to go out there to the beach, but get out there to pray and to witness and those kind of things. To heal the sick and save the lost. He's activating us for work of ministry. And Ephesians 4, 11, and 12 talks about the activating of the saints for the work, ergon, the work of ministry. Within your traditional church, the ministry primarily has been left up to the person, man or woman, in the pulpit. In this new era church that God is bringing forth, in the way it was in the book of Acts, it was left up to the person who was in the pulpit. It was given unto the entire body to do the work of the ministry. Stephen did tremendous works of the Lord and did signs and wonders and miracles, yet the Bible defines him as a deacon. But he was not your normal, ordinary deacon. He was not a deacon as you know a deacon. The deacons in those days did miracles. The deacons in these days just have a title. But God is shifting that. He's shifting that to the place where you and I will operate in signs and wonders and miracles. And we have to be willing to be activated. And then we have to be willing to do something to take a risk 
to do something we've never done before. Look at somebody say, it's time to take a risk. In Acts 17, 6, and I like the way the New King James brings it out, it says, those who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Now, they actually went into Jason's house, a man by the name of Jason here, because he was housing Paul. And Paul and his crew were causing upset in the region. They were upsetting the status quo. One translation says, those who have upset the world have come here also. And Paul was upsetting things because Paul was not the kind of person who just flowed with the, went with the status quo. He didn't flow with that. He was a person who intentionally came in and upset things through the message that he preached, through the delivering of miracles and healings. Paul was a disruptor. Now, I, I have adopted this word disruptor ever since I heard a few weeks ago the news calling Trump a di disruptor. Whenever I heard that, it resonated in my spirit, and the Lord says, that's what I've called you, that's what I've called the church to be, I've called them to be a disruptor. Somebody who will disrupt the status quo. Amen. You see, we've been living in a world that has been what they think is right side up. But like Paul, we're going to turn it the other way. Heard Damon Thompson preach one time about the upside down gospel. And how that the gospel of Jesus Christ turns everything upside down. The gospel of the kingdom. He also talked about the danger of domesticated prayers in this same message. And how our praying has become domesticated. It has been tamed to the point that we're no longer ruthless in our prayer any longer. We're no longer going after the Lord with everything within us. We actually have become tame and kind of like just roll along. It says in the New Living Translation, it says, Paul and Silas have caused trouble all over the world, they shouted. And now they are here disturbing our city too. We are called to turn this world upside down. We are called to be disruptors of the status quo. I want you to say this with me. I am a divine disruptor. That's who you are. You are a divine disruptor. You have been called to disrupt things. You have been called to change things. Being a divine disruptor means that we have to clearly define our role as to who we are in the body of Christ. Because as Pastor Kendall mentioned a moment ago, and I said this yesterday, stop thinking of yourself as just sheep. You are not just sheep. The Bible identifies us as overcomers. Sheep don't overcome. It also identifies us as soldiers. Sheep, sheep do not, they're not in an army. It also identifies us as a soldier. Sheep are not soldiers. It identifies us as being more than conquerors. Sheep don't have to be more than a conqueror. But there's several different aspects to who we are in Christ. So we are sheep, but we're not just sheep. And there's a time that the sheep has to transform into a warrior, and we're in that time. There's a time that the sheep has to be like Nehemiah and his men when they were building the wall. They had a tool in one hand and a sword in another hand. They were ready to do battle against the Sambalat and Tobiah group whom they had said that you have no inheritance in what God is doing here. And this is the way that we have to approach the enemy by saying to him, you have no inheritance in what God is doing. You have no inheritance in this nation. You have no inheritance in this space coast. You have no inheritance in Keystone Heights. You have to begin getting ruthless and not domesticated. So let's look at Matthew 16, verse 18 and 19. I've got it typed out here. And I give you the name Peter, a stone, and this truth of who I am will be the bedrock foundation on which I build my church, my legislative assembly. And the power of death will not be able to overpower it, 
And I will give you the keys of heaven's kingdom realm to forbid on earth that which is forbidden in heaven and to release on earth that which is released in heaven. You have to get a picture of what the Lord is saying here because he's referring not to a church building. He's referring here to ecclesia as a legislative body. You see, this morning we're assembling as a congregation. We're not assembling yet as an ecclesia. It's very different. You can't be an ecclesia until you begin legislating. When Peter and John walked up to the gate called Beautiful and they took authority and began making a declaration to that man that brought him out of his lameness, they, uh, being lame, they were then operating as an ecclesia. Whenever you go with me, if you go with me to Tallahassee in September, we will be operating as an ecclesia. It's two different things. Congregation, ecclesia. The word church here, where it's written in Matthew 16, 18, is really not even, that word church shouldn't even be there. What should be there is legislative assembly, but King James would not put that there because he did not want any other government other than his government ruling in the earth. So they removed that word legislative assembly and put the word church, which is the Greek word kyriakos. It's not a bad word. It means belonging to the Lord. It's what that word means. Now look with me in this next portion here, Matthew 16, 18. The Greek word for church is ekklesia, meaning legislative assembly or selected ones. This is not a religious term at all, but a political and governmental term that is used many times in classical Greek for a group of people who have been summoned and gathered together to govern the affairs of a city. For Jesus to use this term mean, means he is given the keys of governmental authority in his kingdom to the church. This is very important here. You see, one of the things that the ecclesia is called to do is to govern the affairs of their city. It's also called to govern the affairs of their state, govern the affairs of their nation. And I'm not talking necessarily about civil government, although the ecclesia should be very influential in civil government. I want to get an ecclesia up to the point here on the Space Coast where we can bring the political leaders in and decide and let them know whether we're going to vote for them or not. Or we can let them know whether or not they're going to be elected because there's such a force behind the ecclesia that what the ecclesia says is what's going to happen within the city. Govern the affairs. And that's something we've not done is to govern affairs, not just within a city, but we've not governed as a, as a body. We have more or less tolerated We've tolerated Jezebel, we've tolerated Pythos, we've tolerated sickness and disease. We've just tolerated all these different things, and, and, and many times we'll just say, well, that must be the Lord's will. We've tolerated our lack in finances, and we just say, well, that must be the Lord's will. And that toleration has brought us to a place where we're not effective in our walk with the Lord, we're not effective in our community, and it's called caused the church not to. I mean, caused the world not to look on the church, as Peter and John said to the man at the gate. He said, "Look on us." And because of our ineffectiveness, the world no longer looks on us. There was a time when, in the White House, when we went to war, they would call Billy Graham into the White House to have him pray with the president. They no longer do that. Because they wanted prayers from the Lord. They wanted the counsel of the Lord before they went into battle. It's a good word there. The Greeks' definition was a legislative assembly. And you won't find any of this in Strong's Concordance, by the way. You can, only find, you can find it through studying Greek history. Greek, this word was being used 600 years prior to Christ. And to the Romans, it was a group of Roman citizens, an ecclesia that was led by an apostle, which was a general or admiral, that taught the way of Rome. 
they would go into a conquered region and they would teach the culture, the ways, the language of Rome until everything walked and talked and acted like Rome. Jesus called this the leaven of the kingdom in Matthew 13, 33. Now this is important because what is happening here when you begin reading that definition and reading what Jesus said, the Romans and what the Lord intends for us to do is to colonize the earth. To colonize the earth with kingdom people. I'll talk more about that in a minute. People who are kingdom minded. It's the Lord's intent for you and I to give birth to more and more kingdom people in the earth. The more we give birth to kingdom people, the more we have people come to the Lord and not be converts, but be disciples. And as I said last Sunday, and I said yesterday, Billy Graham Evangelistic Organization did a survey, and less than 1% of all those who walked down in Billy Graham's crusades, less than 1% stayed in a church. They have a big museum erected at the Bible Museum in D.C., for the next, I think it's up to around the first of the year. And they're going to be showing things about Billy Graham. And I saw that this morning. But we have, we have gotten away from discipleship. And we've just been making converts. And as an ecclesia, not only do you rule, but you're called to make disciples as well. Jesus never said to go and make converts. Let me say that again. He never said go and make converts, and this is part of the ecclesia work. I don't get fully into it this Sunday, but part of the ecclesia work is to make disciples of all nations. Say all nations. We're to disciple nations. We're to disciple cultural mountains. And the higher you can disciple on that cultural mountain of business or cultural mountain of media, the greater your influence will be to change that mountain. If you can become friends with the CEO of CBS News and begin to influence he or she, whoever runs that, then you begin influencing the media mountain because you want to get as high to the top as you can in your influence. This is a good, this is good. This is the leaven of the kingdom. Also, don't be afraid to disciple sinners. Many times they need you to disciple them rather than try to witness to them. Disciple them. Learn how to disciple a sinner. Learn how to talk to him, even as Jesus did. When he talks to the woman at the well, he begins reading her mail. Second page. Purpose of the ecclesia is to rule and to govern. It does this through the Holy Spirit and is responsible. The ecclesia's responsibility is to bring heaven into earth, not just in worship. Now, we brought heaven into earth this morning in worship. There's no doubt in my mind about that. But not just in worship, not just in preaching. When I leave here and I walk and I, or I go to Papa Gallo's when I walk out of here, I go where I know I'm going today for lunch then I am to bring heaven into that place. And I shared this on yesterday, that if you and I were to go into where I'm going today to eat lunch for 30 days, and all we talked about the entire time that we're there, say we're there an hour every day, we would change the atmosphere and begin changing the culture in that restaurant. Because you've done nothing but talked about Jesus. You've gone in there and probably prayed. And you can't go in there and talk about world events and talk about what Brother Hoopendiddle did and Sister Who Done It did. Because that's not going to change the atmosphere. That's just going to keep the atmosphere that they have there going. But if you talk about nobody but Jesus, you actually begin disciple in a restaurant. And they will notice something different about you, and you will begin leading people to the Lord and discipling them inside that restaurant. You will begin having, if you want to call, have church, you will begin having church in a restaurant. This is good. 
Turn in your Bibles to Acts 26. This is one of my favorite verses of Scripture. We'll begin up in verse 14 and go down through 18. And this is where Paul, Apostle Paul, is reciting to King Agrippa his conversion and what the Lord did for him on the road to Damascus. And when we had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goats. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But arise and stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you, to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things which I will appear to you, delivering you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God in order that they may receive the forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. Now I love this because Paul begins defining what took place for him at his conversion and he continued that on in his walk with the Lord. But he says here in verse 16, this is what Jesus says to him, but arise and stand on your feet. And one of the things that the ecclesia has got to begin doing today is to arise and get on their feet. We have been sitting for way too long, accepting what Jezebel does in society, <clears throat> accepting what happens in our life, accepting the lack of miracles within the body of Christ. We've been accepting all of this. We now have to begin to arise and begin taking a stand. Arise and stand on your feet. Then he goes on and he says to Jesus, uh, Jesus says to Paul, he says, for this purpose I have appeared to you. And I, he, then he begins defining the purpose. But let me share this with you. He begins releasing the purpose. God begins releasing the purpose of why he's saving Paul. And one, one of the things you don't see there, which is very important, he did not save him for the purpose of taking him to heaven. Heaven's a part of what we receive, but he did not save him for that purpose. Go and read it again. He saved him for the purpose of ministry. He saved him for the purpose of relationship. He said, for this purpose I have appeared to you. And then he says, to make you a minister. The Passion Translation says, to make you my assistant. I like that. He says, I've appeared to you for a purpose, to appoint you a minister. And that word minister there, I hope you're taking notes. That word minister is huperetes in the Greek. H-U-P-E-R-E-T-E-S. Huperetes. It defines a picture of a man or anyone as what is called an under rower. An under rower, like rowing a boat. And an under rower, to get a picture of this, you may have seen it on TV or in a movie years ago where you, you saw men in the bottom of a ship and they're rowing in cadence. And there is a man shouting out that cadence who has been promoted from being an under rower to being over those who are under rowers. Most of the time the under rowers were slaves. They were not people who were hired. They were just forced labor to do this. But it's a picture of you and I, as Paul said, that he was a slave unto the Lord. It's a picture of you and I under rowing according to the Lord's cadence. According to the cadence that he's releasing today. But the thing about an under rower is that an under rower is always rowing with other people. So he or she or whoever it is under rowing has to be in unity, especially with the person on the other side. They have to row in unity. They have to row in cadence. When the cadence is released from heaven, it requires you and I to row in unity. Not for us to do our own thing. Because if you ever rowed a boat, or you ever been in a canoe, and you have two people 
paddling or rowing opposite of each other, what happens to you? You go in circles, or you do like Cheryl and I did, you wind up in the bushes where the snakes are. And so one of the things that the Lord has commanded us is that we've got to begin taking on His assignment. See, I believe that God wants to give us unity of purpose. Not just so that we can get along. But that there's, if you, if you read properly Psalms 113, where it says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together. How? In unity. Unity is a noun. You can't do a noun. Let me say that again. Unity is a noun. You can't do a noun. The verb in that sentence is the verb dwell. He says, he says there, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell under rowers, dwelling in the bottom of a ship, rowing together. To dwell together, the results of knowing how to dwell is unity. And he says, the result of that unity is that the Lord commands a blessing. The oil begins to flow. And the Lord begins commanding the blessing. It's not, it's not about everybody just loving each other and everybody getting along and there's nothing wrong with that. We should do that. But it's about having unity of purpose. And so he wants you and I to be an under roar today in this ecclesia move of God that he's bringing in the earth. The purpose of the ecclesia is to rule, is to govern. It rules through Holy Spirit. Now let's look at what else the Lord said to Paul. Make you a hooperetes, an under roar. And a witness not only to the things which have been seen, but also the things which I will appear to you. It goes down to verse 18. To open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light. He was saying to Paul, I'm going to give you authority to open the eyes of those who are walking in darkness. This is not just going to be something that I'm nice thing that I'm telling you. He's saying to Paul, I'm giving you this authority. I've appointed you to this. You're going to shift people from darkness to light. And at times you're going to shift multitudes. And one of the things we need today is an ecclesia that will rise up and begin shifting the eyes of the blind from darkness into light. And that's what an ecclesia is called to do, is to shift from darkness to light. Say shift. <coughs> he wants us to shift from darkness to light, but then he goes on there to say, and from the dominion of Satan. See, the world has been under the dominion of the enemy. Under the min dominion of the enemy. Well, we'll read here in a few minutes that God has given his ecclesia dominion in the earth. He's given that to us as a part of our character, as a part of our makeup, to take dominion, to have dominion. How many of you guys ever hunted? Josh, we have to go this fall, okay? Deer hunting. And uh, there is a, an essence when you go hunting of taking dominion over that which you're hunting. You're literally going out and you're searching for it. You're not going out just hoping it's going to come by. You find the game trails. You find where they're eating. You find where they're watering. And that's where you go. You're searching on purpose. At the same time, and, and to tell you a story, some of you have heard this, but for those who haven't and are listening online, back years ago, back when I was in my early, late 20s, my dad gave me a single shot 30-30 for Christmas. And I took that single shot 30-30 and I went out the day after Christmas to go deer hunting. And I'm walking to my deer stand where I'm going to overlook a large field. Fills several thousand acres. But I, know, I knew where the game trail was. And so on my way there, it was still dark on my way. I began thanking the Lord. I said, Father, I just want to thank you for the buck I'm going to kill today. And Lord, I just command this buck to come to me in Jesus' name. I decree that he is mine. 
And so I, I prayed that all the way up to the sand. I'm sitting on a hill out in a field overlooking the large field. It's hot. It's about 80 degrees in Alabama on Christmas Day, which is not characteristic at all. And all of a sudden, I get ready to go home, and this deer jumps the fence about 100 yards down. But I've got a single shot 30-30 with no scope. And I, and I saw it, and I couldn't see any horns. But it was doe season, and I wanted meat from my freezer because that's the way Cheryl and I raised our kids. We did eat beef and chicken, but we ate a lot of deer and rabbit and squirrel and dove and those kind of things, turkey and fish. And uh, so we're a little bit domesticated, okay? And so I raised up my gun, and I raised it up high enough because a 30-30, especially without a scope, is accurate to just about 100 yards. That's about as far as it's going to reach out. And I raise it up high enough that when I shot, bam, this deer comes down. And I go down there, I walk it off, it's 110 yards is what it was. Famous shot. And I walk down there, and lo and behold, if I don't have a buck. He had horns about that long. But I couldn't see him with my eye from that distance. I'm saying all that to tell you to, that as I took dominion in the natural, God wants us to take dominion in the spiritual realm also. He wants us to take dominion in our society, take dominion. If you've been having the devil tormenting you, it's time for you to take dominion. It's time to, for you to go clean out your house. Walk in there this afternoon, take dominion. I cast every devil out of here. You start naming them by names, tormenting demons, demons of migraine headaches, demons that torment me in the night that don't let me sleep. I take authority and dominion over you, and I command you to go in Jesus' name. Our oldest grandson, Levi, when he was a little boy, Cheryl and I lived in a split-level home and, uh, in Haines City. And he was afraid to go down into the bottom of the house by himself. And I said to Levi, I said, why don't you go down there? And, and Levi's a very dramatic kid. He and his, all of his siblings are dramatic, I think. He says, there's boogers down there. I said, there's what? He said, there's boogers down there. I said, you know... I'm a booger killer. So I grabbed Levi. I said, let's mean you go down there. And I got the Bible. I just started waving it. I said, I cast every one of you boogers out of here now. I command you to go in Jesus' name. And you're going to leave Levi alone. And you're not going to torment him anymore. Every booger, get out of here now. Levi just grinning from ear to ear. I mean, it was about six years old, maybe seven years old. He's grinning from ear to ear. I look at him. I say, how do you think them boogers feel now? He said, Popo, they don't like you. <laughs> you need to begin taking your dominion, taking your authority in life. Don't let life run you over. You take the helm. You take the rein. You become the one who is the head and not the tail, as Deuteronomy tells us. You be the head and not the tail. You be above and not beneath. Listen to this. Matthew 6, 9 and 10. For our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The kingdom strategy that the kingdom of God has is to get his kingdom into the earth now. It's to heavenize earth. You see, earth was like heaven before the fall. Before man sinned, that whole garden of Eden that God gave him to cultivate was just like heaven. And he told him, he said, you've got to cultivate this. It means you've got to steward. You've got to be a husband to this garden. You have to steward that garden. You can't let things in here that do not need to be in here. And I mentioned this recently that when you look at that Garden of Eden, there were two trees there, not just one. It wasn't just a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There was also the tree of life. 
And that tree of life is the tree that He's called you and I to eat from. When you and I are speaking negative things, we're speaking out of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. When we're speaking the Word of God and we have a happy countenance and the joy of the Lord is in our heart, we're eating from the tree of life. Majority of Christians today, and this is going to shock you, I hope it does, are eating from the wrong tree. They're eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the thing is, is that we eat from the good side of that tree and not the evil side. You can find what I'm sharing with you now in Rick Joyner's book, There are Two Trees in the Garden. And so even, and I mentioned this too recently, that in, in church when you see a person, whether they're praying or worshiping or dancing or preaching or whatever, and they, the attention is commanded to them, they're eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And if you eat from that tree, when they throw the fruit at you, you're going to like it too. So you have to really begin to discern what tree am I eating of? Am I eating from a tree of self-satisfaction? Listen, this is so different from where we have been in the past. In the past, the church has been very narcissistic. Do you know what narcissist means? How many of you know what it means? Okay, some of you don't. Narcissist means a person who is focused on themselves. They love their beauty. This term came out of Greek mythology. I'm not a proponent of Greek mythology. I'm just going to tell you where the term came from. A narcissus was a man who was consumed so much with his own beauty that he stared in a pond all day long, all night, all the time. To the point that he died because he took in no nutrition or anything like that. The gods, the Greek gods were so impressed by him that they turned him into a narcissus flower. Maybe you know what a narcissus flower is. A narcissist flower is a daffodil. Very beautiful, but what does a daffodil not do? It doesn't have fragrance. And see, the church has been this way. It's been very beautiful, but it has not had a fragrance. It's not been salt and light. We've been very narcissistic to where our focus has been on ourselves. We have been self-absorbed in who we are. We have been need-oriented and need-based and dysfunctional as well. We've been very much a dysfunctional church without the signs and wonders and miracles. We go to church today based on whether or not that church meets my needs. What I'm looking for in a, in a congregation, in a church, so to speak, is whether or not that church is equipping me to do the work of the ministry. Not meeting my needs. You should never go to a church based on whether or not it meets your needs. If you do, you're narcissistic. Kill that fly. We've been so dysfunctional that there has a dysfunction that's created between here and here. Huge dysfunction. It's so dysfunction that I need you to need me. Because I've told you I can meet your needs. And because... You and I are both so narcissistic, you want me to say, I can meet your needs, but I need you also to say, I need you, pastor, or I need you, apostle. And what we've done, we've created a dysfunction there between the pulpit and the congregation to the point where there's no functioning as warriors. There's no functioning as people who are doing signs and wonders and miracles. We're just here being preached to today. When you leave here, please go and pray for somebody. Please lay hands on somebody. Please go to the city hall and pray. Go to the courthouse and pray. Do it discreetly. Don't be like me and get kicked out of the courthouse like I did over in Pinellas County. Although I was being discreet, they had microphones, and I was praying about like this, but they heard me. And, uh, and they kicked me out. But it was okay. We'd already accomplished what we need to do. When you leave here, go out and love on your family. 
Go out and let, the, you, those of you, you women who have a husband that is unsaved, when you go home, don't be religious to them. Go and love them. Because when you go home and you start loving them, they're going to say, she just came for church. Last time she came, she was nagging me about going to church. This time she comes back from church, and now she's loving me. What's going on at that church? You're getting equipped. This is Pastor Kendall's area. You're getting equipped to love. So when you leave here, you start loving on your family. Here's, here's the danger when, as the prodigals are coming in. Because some of your sons and daughters have been raunchy sinners just like you were before you got saved. Okay? We forget where we come from. I mean, you were real raunchy. And these prodigals are coming in, and we're going to try to be the elder brother and tell them how to do it. Listen, they're not coming to you. They're coming to the Father. The Father of the house, Jehovah God, through Jesus Christ, is what they're coming to. As I shared with you before, they're having, going to have tattoos everywhere you can have a tattoo. They're going to have rings all in their nose, all in their ears, and everywhere else, belly button. Everywhere you can put a ring, they're going to have rings. Like my brother here, he's got tattoos all over his arm. Do I want a tattoo? No, but I love this guy right here. And these guys and gals with tattoos in the church today, they're salt and light in the earth. And a lot of times we have a hard time with the tattooed people. You just need to get that religious demon out of your life. Okay? Did I tell you that I, I've tried to get Cheryl to give me a tattoo? Let, let me have a tattoo? She won't let me have one. I was going to put her name on my arm with flowers. And she says, no, you can't do that. What if something happened to me and, and you wanted to remarry? I said, I put number two right underneath. <laughs> you will always be number one, baby. We've been so dysfunctional as a body. But God is changing us. We're beginning to shift. We're beginning to change. And I want to challenge you to begin making changes in your life. I want to challenge you to begin being a warrior and not letting life run over you. We're shifting from need focus, narcissistic, to kingdom focus. To where we're working together with purpose on purpose. Let me say that again. We're working together with purpose, on purpose. We're also becoming functional as a governmental body. We're becoming functional as an army. We're becoming functional as salt and light in the earth. Now, next month I go to Washington, D.C. I have an assignment to go to every senator's office that's up for re-election. And when I go there, I'm going to do business. Because there's some of them, I am going to take my authority along with the person next to me. We're going to be an ecclesia. And we're going to close the door to those that are pro-death, pro-abortion, those who are for same-sex marriage. We're going to close the door to them in Jesus' name. And we're going to open the door for those candidates that are pro-life, constitutional, marriage between a man and woman. We're going to open the door for them. That's being an ecclesia. I went to one senator's office back on May 7th. I know you know who he is. I won't mention his name, even though he was from this area at one time. I went to his office back on May, and as I opened the door, I went behind the door as I got inside the office, and I pushed it to. And I said, I closed the door. Named his name. I said, you can no longer rule here. Heaven has given you term limits, and you are now termed out. And I stood in there praying. Those two guys at the desk, the receptionist, they just they was wondering what I'm doing. And I just told them, I said, I'm going to our senator's office that, that are from Florida, and so glad to have you here, they said. And so I'm just walking around looking at the pictures on the wall and reading some pamphlets and those kind of things. The whole time, I'm praying in the Spirit. I'm praying softly. I'm not praying loudly. But I'm praying in the Spirit the entire time. They're okay. They've got to go to the airport. 
Bye. And I've got several guys that are going with me. See, that when, when you start talking about ruling and reigning, we have to go and we have to take a look at God's original intent. I'm going to finish this second page here and then I'll close. You have to look at God's original intent. You know when the people who are on the Supreme Court, at least those who are constitutionals, when they begin having a case, they go and look at the Constitution and they try to determine what was the original intent of the writers of the Constitution. And they try to judge based on what they feel like is the original intent. Now, there's some up there that need to be kicked out of there. Some of them need to be impeached because they're using European law to try to rule in America rather than constitutional law, which to me is grounds for impeachment. So we have to look at original intent. And God said in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 through 28, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule. Say rule. Underline that on your sheet. Rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing. That means the devil, because he slithers. Every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, he wants you to rule over. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. I'm going to talk about the fruitful part next week. Here I'm talking about the ruling part this week. And we have to understand that there is an original intent that God has given to mankind to rule. Psalms 115 verse 16 says that the earth, that, that the heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to the sons of men. That means this earth belongs to us. That means we have authority in the earth. We don't, we, we have authority to rule within this earth realm. Now, look with me now a little bit farther. Here's Psalms chapter 8 verses 4 through 6. What is man that you take thought of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than God, and you crown him with glory and majesty, and you make him to rule over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. Now the original intent for man through God and with the authority of God was to have dominion and to rule. This verse of scripture here in chapter 8, verses 4 through 6, he starts out by saying, what is man that you're thinking about him all the time? And the son of man that you care for him. Yet you have made him a little lower than God. And your Bible may translate it as angel, which is the wrong translation. The correct translation is the Hebrew word Elohim. You can go and look this up. You can look it up in Strong's, whatever you want to. And it's one of the names for God. You see, it stands to reason that God would not make you lower than the angels because everything that's higher than you, you worship. Right? So he's made us lower. He's made, he's made us lower than himself, but not lower than the angels. The angels have been created to serve God and you and I. Not the other way around. Give you a picture of this. I mentioned this yesterday. There's an Indian guy by the name of James Jacobs. And when he was a little kid, he was seeking God, trying to find God. And one day in class, his teacher had all the students make idols. And so they all made idols, and after they made the idols, she said to them, now bow down and worship your idol. And everybody was worshiping their idol except James. James was not worshiping his idol, and the teacher goes up to him and said, says to him, James, you made your idol, now you must worship it. And James said to the teacher, me no worship this stupid idol. I made it. It worships me. That's the picture that God made us. We worship him. We don't worship angels. He went on in his search for the Lord. They had deities and gods, statues of them all around this lake. And so one night he went out there. He was in search of God. He was a teenager by this time. And he starts talking to these gods. And he said, said to him. If you don't talk to me, I'm going to throw you in the lake. You talk to me, 
And one God went and talked to him, so he pushed that pole over into the lake. He went to the next one. You don't, there's 12 of them. Talk to me. If you don't talk to me, I'm pushing you in the lake. He pushed all 12 of them in the lake that night. The townspeople got so upset that they were going to kill him. His dad had to grab him and make him leave. He had to leave town. It's a huge story. He goes and he, he goes, God tells him to go to this mountain way off in the distance. And on his way there, because it's so far, he's a, he, he still believes in reincarnation because he hadn't been saved yet, so he lays down on a railroad track. And the train starts coming. He's going to have the train run, run over him. He's going to turn into an eagle, and he's going to fly to the mountain. It said when the train came, he was laying on the wrong track. He gets on his way to the mountain. He meets a missionary, and the missionary leads him to the Lord, and he stays seven years in this mountain, and God teaches him seven different languages in the earth right inside that mountain. Powerful man of God. How does the ecclesia rule? It rules by the Spirit of God, and I'm just going to stop right here for the day. It rules by the Spirit of God. The Lord said it's not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. How is this mountain going to come down? He said to Zerubbabel. Who are you, O great mountain? You cry grace, grace, grace into that mountain. For it's not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. That Zerubbabel were banging the capstones of that mountain and finish the temple. And you and I are in a place right now in America where we've got to finish the work that God started in this nation he laid a foundation of Christianity within this nation. He laid a foundation where you and I could be saved, where you and I would see the gospel of Jesus Christ go into all the earth. We have to finish that work and not let it stop at this point. Stand to your feet.